Welcome, Bridge Connection. I'm glad you joined me today. I hope you're enjoying our time together in the Word. We're in the Gospel of John. We're going to be in uh, verse 8 today. Start with verse 8. Gospel of John, starting with uh, chapter 8, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, take a seat to get a pencil and paper. Maybe you want to make some cross-references to verses or something, but... Uh, it's always good to take notes when you're studying the Word, but hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. I'm having a great time just being with you every day and doing this. So, John 8, chapter 1. John 8, verse 1. Let's try it. We got it right this time, okay? All right. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. There's a real contrast of, of lives of lives here. The contrast is that of Jesus' quiet and worshipful life contrasted at the same time with these turbulent lives of these religious leaders. And Jesus is drawn within the turbulence to calm, settle, and kind of get things, you know, leveled out a little bit. A picture can be drawn of the Christian life as quiet and worshipful, when you contrast that with a turbulent world, you don't get, need to get caught up with, you know, the all the political stuff and all this stuff, and you, it just be calm. Do things and be calm. Notice the reason of Jesus' calm and peace. He got alone with God. He often went off into the Mount of Olives to be alone with God. It was a favorite spot of his. He, he really enjoyed that, man. A place where he could be alone with God, you know, and his disciples at times, a place of quietness where where the Father could meet him, you know, face to face and have a conversation, strengthening, encouraging, uh, sharing with him. Notice also, also that Jesus began his teaching early in the morning. The words came and taught are kind of continuous action in the Greek. The people kept coming to him and he kept teaching them. His very mission in, in life was that of worshiping the Father and and teaching and, and ministering to people. And by this, he demonstrated how all men should walk through life, worshiping God, teaching, ministering to people. Every person needs to be taught, and every man needs the ministry of others during the trials of life. They need us to come and say, hey, you okay? You want to talk and, and uh, share the Lord with them or pray with them. Look at verse verse. Three. Read through verse 6. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. But Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he didn't even hear them. Man's guilt and sin are pictured in all the people involved in this. You know, not Jesus, but everybody else. There was the guilt of the woman and some unknown man. We don't know who he was. Uh, they were both guilty of the serious sin of, of adultery. Uh, this sin of adultery affects so many lives. And because of that, under Jewish law, it was considered so, so serious that the parties were to be stoned to death. Read about Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22. Um, the sin was a, this sin was, was a work of darkness. All sin is, and most sin is actually done under the cover of darkness. An attempt is always made to hide it from wife or husband or mother, father, brother, sister, employer, classmate, friends, you know, the list goes on and on. The, this woman and this man probably thought what well, we all think, that their sin would never be discovered, that no one would ever find out what was going on, but they overlooked two things that um, all of us ignore it sometimes. In the vast majority of cases, Sin has been discovered. And sin, 
the very act of it is always, always seen by God. The sin took place at the time of the feast where the atmosphere was, you know, kind of party hardy. It was all party-like and where men and women were brought together by drinking and, and dancing and the indulgence of the crowd. Such an atmosphere corrupts even those with the best intentions and even the very high morals, which you, you get caught up in things. There was the guilt of, of some witnesses, some people who were offended by the woman in particular. They were really upset with this woman who had been caught in adultery. Jewish law required two witnesses to convict a person. It's most likely that the woman and her male companion were, were seen by the religious leaders. They would not have been in such a defiled atmosphere if, if they weren't, you know, looking for something. The, the scribes and the Pharisees were too strict in their rules and regulations to really be there. But some commentators do think, however, that these religious leaders had some, uh, somebody, some scoundrel to, to set a trap for the woman in order to drag her before Jesus to entrap him. That, to me, that seems most unlikely, but I don't know. Plotting the sin of the flesh does not fit in with the nature of the Pharisees and scribes, but uh, it is just murder, you know. Their sins were more of the spirit, much deeper, but less visible and less condemnatory to the public. They didn't do things that the public would see. They were even viewing such things. The point is this. The witnesses who caught the woman in the act of adultery, they were great sinners. They were vindictive. They were revengeful. They wanted to strike out and get back at her. She was publicly exposed. She should have been held in custody in some private place until judgment was passed, but she was unmercifully dragged before the public to, to expose her sin and to shame and to punish her. Why? Well, apparently she'd hurt her husband or some loved one so much that he maybe struck out to get her. Let's make an obstacle, you know, an object lesson of this. My wife, what she's done. Public exposure was maybe a way to strike, strike back at her, I don't know. But the man who committed adultery, who was with her, was not exposed. Why? Well, I don't know. He could have escaped, fled before they grabbed her. Um, he could have been freed or he could have bought off his accusers. He could have been released because as in the case in so many societies, misbehavior, sin by men was much more acceptable than by women for some reason. There was also the guilt of the religious leaders and the public. When the accusers dragged the woman to the religious leaders, people all along the way joined in as the case so often is and crowds were beginning to build as this was going on. The religious leaders saw a a chance to test Jesus. So they took the woman before him, hoping to discredit him. If Jesus said the woman was not guilty, he would be breaking Jewish law and you know, opening himself up to the charge of being too lenient with sin. So they thought they had him. If Jesus said the woman was guilty and should be killed, he would be breaking be breaking Roman law, which did not consider adultery a sin worthy of death, just the Jewish law. He would also be criticized as lacking mercy and love, compassion and forgiveness. And you notice several things about the dark nature of, of man seen in these religious leaders and in the crowd who joined in the public exposure. There was a sinful spirit among all those involved, kind of a spirit of, of self-righteousness that just lacked forgiveness. I don't want forgiveness. I just, I'm going to be self I'm going to take care of this and you're going to pay for what you've done. I'm not forgive you for what you've done. There was judging that lacked compassion of, of uh, kind of uh, censoring that, that, lacked understanding. They didn't try to understand. They just censored the, the lady, the woman. 
It was a, a condemnation, a condemning at, uh, attitude that lacked sympathy of any kind. It was punishing that lacked restoration of savagery, savagery that lacked curing, of, of destroying that lacked the second chance. We always need to know that we need to be the bearers of forgiveness when somebody asks for it or we've caught something or we were involved with something. We need to walk in that forgiveness as Jesus does in our life every single day. There was also hypocrisy. They felt and claimed that they, they were religious, better than the woman, free from any sin, serious enough to be exposed at least. They even used scripture to condemn her sin and to support their right to condemn her. And a complete failure to do what we all need sometimes, to be pulled and embraced out of the sin and hurt gripping us. That's what we're supposed to be doing, gripping those and embracing those and bring them out of that sin and helping them if we can, as we can. There was a complete failure to hush, to be quiet and say nothing except to the one caught in sin and to set about a ministry of restoration and reconciliation to God and, and man. There was Jesus ignoring sinful man as long as he could. He stooped down and with his, with his finger, he wrote on the ground saying nothing. He was silent for a long time. We're, we're not told what he wrote on the ground. Various commentators say it was maybe to allow him to think through the situation before he spoke, he wanted some time to um, force the accusers to repeat the charges. By doing so, then the public would begin to see and sense their lack of compassion, to write scriptures or some of the sins of those standing around hoping to convict them. I like that one. I hope it was that one. He just, okay, Hosea. And then he turns around and walks away, writing different ones that are sent down. I don't know if he did that, but I think that would be really cool if he did. Notice this. Jesus did ignore them in all their sinful, critical, self-righteous, hypocritical spirit, but he had ignored them only for a time. Jesus will not ignore nor allow sin to go on forever. He will arise, face it, and judge it. It's true in all of our lives, guys. And um, he loves us so much, he'll expose us. As believers, he'll expose us, man. Verse seven. And so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he was without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again, I hope he was right. Anyway. Verse nine, then those who heard it being convicted of their, by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. I just see them leaving as he was writing names in death. You know, here's the deal. Everybody is sinful and guilty of serious sin. The woman was guilty of a very serious sin. The law said she was to be condemned to death. The Jewish law, her accusers and the people were right, legally justified in their charge. If they were to be stopped from killing her, and even more, if they were to be corrected and rebuked, something phenomenal would have, would have to happen. It did. And notice exactly what it was. It said verse seven. It says, he that is without sin let him first cast a stone. No man is without sin. Every one of the men standing there knew it, and every one of them was convicted within their conscience, I believe, man. They all left, leaving Jesus and the woman alone. It says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Jesus said that the stones could be cast at the sinner. But he placed a limitation on casting stones. He said, he who is without sin, let him first cast a stone. Notice it means that only Jesus can judge. 
for no person is without sin. Casting stones is not based on how much scripture a person knows, nor on how great a person's calling and, and gifts are, nor on the position a person has. It's based upon moral goodness and, 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 and perfection, and no man has achieved that. You're all familiar with this verse, man. And why do you stand there looking at that moat that's in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how you will say to your brother, let me pull out that moat that's in your eye and behold, a beam is in your eye. You're a hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to cast out the moat from your brother's eye. You remember that, don't you, from Matthew chapter seven? Pretty convincing, pretty convicting. We'll read verse, verse 10 and 11. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I've heard Jesus say that to my heart. Neither do I condemn you. Just go and sin no more, Jeff. Jesus alone has the right to condemn and to forgive. The picture of the woman is the picture of, of every person. You know, when it, when it comes to sin and judgment, Every one of us stands alone before God. We stand stripped of all righteousness for no person possesses righteousness. There are no accusers, not among men. No man can condemn the woman nor anyone else. The only righteousness and the only perfection, the only one who is not guilty of sin is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He alone is worthy to stand in judgment. However, notice most of the most glorious news in, in all of human history. Jesus did not condemn, but gave a second chance. Go and sin no more. I love that. Luke 17, 4 says, and if he trespass against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day turn against to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? He thought he was being very generous there. And Jesus said to him, seven, 70 times seven. Wow. Jesus wanted to forgive and did forgive. He said to this lady, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Stop your sinning. Make a clean break. Do it no more. The warning is clear. Repentance is essential for forgiveness. We can't just be sorry for our sin. We have to be sorry that we repent. See, repentance is... I'm going this way, but I'm gonna turn and go the opposite way. I'm not gonna sin anymore. Doesn't mean we're not gonna fall, we're not gonna fail at times, absolutely, but we're not gonna be, our, our, our direction in life will not be sin. Our choices in our every day is not gonna be for sin, it's gonna be for righteousness and for doing what God wants. We're gonna fail and mess up sometimes, of course. We all do, you confess that, he forgives us, but when he's saying there's repentance, that means that what, I'm, I'm in this sin, I repent, Lord, and I choose to go the other direction. I, I, I don't wanna, and, and it's the, the bent of your life, the, the, the direction of your life, of my life, cannot be in sin and just keep asking God to forgive us. It needs to be, Lord, I, I wanna go and sin no more. I want to reveal you through my life to those around me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this pretty incredible Bible story, Lord. 
We thank you that you are the God of the second chances of third, fourth, fifth. We thank you. We don't want to take advantage of that, Lord, but thank you that your grace is always sufficient. Lord, we want to be men and women, children of God, who repent and choose not to walk in the sin that that, that, that we've confessed to you, Lord. Um, we're going to fall sometimes. We're going to confess it. You're going to pick us up. We're going to go on. But just living in that sin, Lord, we're, we confess that to you, Jesus. You know, if you're listening right now and there's sin in your life that you know it's something that maybe you've talked to him a thousand times about it, but it's still there. This is a day you just need to repent and go the other direction. Just choose to do that. Just in your own heart, just say, Jesus, I'm tired of this. I, I've, I've been judging other people. I've been criticizing others. And there's this in me, Lord. And I, I choose to surrender this sin to you, God. And also teach me, Lord, how to be a forgiving person. As you forgive me, Lord, I, I, want to, I want to forgive others, you know, and I want to not judge others for anything that they're doing, Lord. I, I, I want to bring your love and your truth and your forgiveness to everybody I run into, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Your name. Okay, we'll see you next time, okay? We'll pick it up right where we left off. Have a great day. God bless you.